Thank you. The topic for today is strategies for engaging students in the classroom. And my name is Yvonne Johnson. I am the Multimodal Teaching Coordinator in the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center. And you can connect with me via email, telephone, Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, I'm on various social media outlets. I am happy to connect with you. So again, we'll be talking about strategies for engaging students in the classroom. I've tried to post some pictures that show engagement. To help us to build engagement among the group of people online today, if you could please type your name and your department and university in the chat box. And as I said, the chat box is represented by the bubble um, on the bottom of your screen. And welcome to those of you who are still joining us. We appreciate that. Okay, so we have people from different departments. We have uh, philosophy, curriculum and instruction, music, um, grad students, instructors, professors. So that's awesome. We're very happy to have you and such a wonderful mix of disciplines and people online today. Really appreciate you coming on and joining us. We're going to talk about um, what engagement looks like. We're going to talk about the dimensions of engagement, strategies for increasing engagement in the classroom, techniques for increasing engagement in large classes. We will uh, look at some different tools and some resources. And as I said, the recording will be available um, in a couple of days, and I will share that link with you so that you have access to that as time goes on. I took a couple of pictures from uh, the NIU media site and tried to depict different examples of engagement. So when you think of engagement and you think of examples of what students look like when they're engaged, what do you see? You see um, expressions on their faces. You see that they're making eye contact with each other, that they are connecting, partnering, they're using technology, they're working with equipment, there are emotions on their faces. And when you're teaching, you see these different indicators of student engagement. And we'll be talking about how we can enhance that today. We typically look for oral participation or submissions in online courses uh, we, to determine if students are engaged. We can also look for nonverbal attentiveness, their body language, are they taking notes, are they sharing information with others. So those are different signs of engagement. What other signs of engagement can you all think of um, when you think about students engaged with your classes, in your classes? Uh, did somebody raise their hand? Okay, so students are, you know, they might be moving around depending on the activity. They are looking at each other's faces, things like that. So we'll talk about how to enhance that today. I put together just a quick wordle of different terms related to engagement, things that would exemplify if students are engaged in the classroom. So they might be taking notes. They would have a certain level of attentiveness. They're paying attention to the activity or to the people in their group, to the professor, the instructor. They're making eye contact. They might be smiling. They might have a look of maybe they're perplexed. Um, their body language gives you certain cues. So. I just put together an example of a different way to communicate with students and it represents, it's a wordle and it's a more visual way that you can engage students in the classroom. So I just took examples of engagement, put them in a, a free wordle tool and then 
um, saved the file to my computer and shared it this way. So that is one example of a way that you can increase engagement, have visual cues as well as the oral and written cues. To focus our discussion on engagement, let's talk about the different dimensions of engagement. And in terms of engagement, you can consider it from behavioral perspectives, emotional perspectives, and cognitive perspectives. So the behavioral dimension of engagement is what are the students doing in the class? How are they performing? Do their behaviors demonstrate that they have persistence, concentration, attention to what's going on in the class? Are they persisting when they are challenged in the class? Or do they sort of say, oh, that's beyond my um, expertise. I don't think I can do that. Persistence um, helps to demonstrate that they're behaviorally engaged in the class. Are they asking for clarification? Are they asking questions and communicating? Are they following course rules and norms? Sometimes uh, professors say, well, um, students ask questions and the answer is in the syllabus. Um, but they ask a question that shows that perhaps they missed that aspect of information in the syllabus. So one way that you can engage students with uh, the course rules and expectations in terms of what's listed in the syllabus, you can give a quick quiz related to the syllabus and draw the student's attention to the key aspects of the syllabus that you really want them to pay attention to. And I had a discussion with my daughter about this. She was an undergraduate student at the time. And she said something about her, her professor gave a quiz on the syllabus. And I, so I, the pedagogical person in me started asking her questions to collect information about it. So I said, well, why do you think the professor gave you that quiz? And she said, well, I don't know. I, I think it's, you know, I don't know if it's really that important of assign, an assignment. And I said, well, what did you learn when you completed that quiz? And she said, well, I learned the due dates, and I learned the rubrics, and I learned the major assignments, and I learned the attendance policy. And so she continued to list these different insights that she gained from that quiz on the syllabus. And then she stopped for a moment and said, well, I guess I really did learn something from that, from that quiz. And that's a simple way to engage students with, kind of get them engaged right away with, with the course and the expectations. So they're starting off on a sound footing. Another dimension is an emotional dimension of engagement. And we probably have all heard of connections between emotion and learning. And there's research to show that when learning is connected with emotion, that the learning, um, the information is retained longer. And students may get a deeper understanding of the information in that learning experience. And last year for our spring 2017 Teaching Effectiveness Institute, we had a speaker, Sarah Kavanaugh, from Assumption College. And she spent an entire day with our faculty and staff um, who attended the institute and shared her research related to connecting emotions and learning. And she has published a book. And we won't get into the emotional aspect of the dimension of engagement too much today, other than to say that the URL that I have posted here on the screen is a URL that you will be able to put into your browser. And when you access that site, the resources that she shared related to emotion and connecting that with learning are available on the Faculty Development and Instructional Design website for NIU. So I wanted to make sure that you knew that those resources were available. And attitudes toward learning are an aspect of the student's emotional dimension of engagement with learning. Are students, are they positive about the learning? Are they motivated to learn? Things like that connect with the emotional dimension of learning. And then the third dimension of learning 
is the cognitive engagement dimension. And if students are cognitively engaged, then they're, they use, they, they put forth effort and they utilize strategies that will help them learn. They put um, specific focus on how they can be effective learners. And they will go beyond just the bare minimum to learn more um, depth about the topics and to more, uh, learn more breadth. So they are um, demonstrating more effort and trying to learn more complexity than just meeting the baseline for the course. And when we think about engagement, the behavioral and emotional and cognitive dimensions of engagement are intertwined. They interrelate. They're not separate. And when I was looking for information to show active learning techniques and some of the different information about the time that it takes to develop these or use these techniques in class, I found this spectrum. And the spectrum was designed by a couple of people from the University of Michigan. And the activities on the spectrum range from the simple to the more complex. And there are various examples of active learning techniques that you can use in class to engage the students. If you look at the simple part of the spectrum, you can see one minute paper. I don't know how many of you have used those, but one minute papers can be an example of where you provide students one minute to write down a couple of things they learned in class, things that they still have questions about, and it's just a quick synopsis of the session for the day. You could also have them post that in Blackboard if you wanted to see what um, questions, maybe collect the questions and address those similar questions in the next class. And you can see from this chart that as the activities become more complex, then there's more time um, required. And time is on this axis. It doesn't really have it on the chart. but there's simple to complex, and then the time increases. A number of you have probably used think, pair, share, where you provide a question to students. You ask them to talk to their neighbor and then share the information that they learned in that discussion with the whole class. There's different versions of that technique that's um, lower on the requirements in terms of time for the class. That's not very complicated to set it up. Experiential learning obviously takes more time. Maybe you may even give students time out of class. You may assign a certain day for people to do their experiential learning. But what I would encourage you to do is when you design active learning techniques and techniques to in increase engagement with students in the class, that you think very carefully of aligning those activities with your teaching and learning goals. Why are you using this activity? Does it make sense to use this activity to teach these certain concepts? And we'll talk about some specific activities today and a few tools that you can use to you to employ different engagement techniques in your class. A couple of different techniques that you can use are introductions and greetings. And introductions and greetings are important because there, we talked about the emotional aspect, dimension of engagement. In, when, when I teach a class, I always greet the students. The first day of class, I, I go up. When they um, enter the room, I shake their hand. I welcome them to the class, introduce myself, make eye contact with them, smile warmly so that they know that they're welcome in the class. And some, some instructors or professors do this um, every class. And I try to greet the students at the beginning of every class. Sometimes you're setting up some of the activities for the day. But it is important to show students that 
you value them as a person, that you connect with them, and appreciate them as a member of your class. Icebreakers are another approach that you can use to increase engagement, and we'll talk a little bit about those in, in a minute. Concept maps, storytelling, portfolios, and social media are also different ways that you can increase engagement in your classes. It is important on the first day of class to make sure that you connect with the students and then build upon those connections and build help students to build connections with each other. And then they're more likely to be engaged in the class. They're more likely to engage with each other because they're building those relationships throughout the entire semester. In terms of icebreakers, why might you consider using an icebreaker? Well, one of the reasons that you might consider using an icebreaker is it's an informal activity that you can structure to gain information about the students. A biographical type of aspect of, is part of an icebreaker activity. But you can also use icebreakers to gain information about the student's level of knowledge about the course material. You can use icebreakers to determine what the student's goal for the course are. And so what I do is I design icebreakers. There are a wide variety of icebreaker activities that you can use. And I have placed URLs on the screen, and if you copy those and put them in your browser, then it will take you to a couple of different sites. And when you look at those sites, you'll see one site has explanations for why you would use icebreakers. And the second site has explanations for it actually has examples of a variety of different icebreakers that you can use. So I use icebreakers the first day of class. When, when the class starts, whatever time the class starts, I have everyone in the class get up and I have them um, have an icebreaker prepared for them. So they're standing up, they have this piece of paper that has very carefully designed questions on them. They might look simple, but they're very carefully designed to connect with the teaching and learning goals of the course, to elicit the information, like I said, the student's knowledge of the material that you're going to be teaching that semester, their goals for the class, information about what are their hobbies, so that when they share information with each other, they can find ways to connect with other students. And when they start to have connections with other students, then they're more engaged with the class because they'll start talking to each other and sharing information and bouncing ideas about their questions in class off of other students. And icebreakers are informal, so they are a more safe type of opportunity for students to meet each other. If it was more of a formal activity, they might not be as, as comfortable. And the icebreakers can connect the behavioral, you know, they're up and moving, the emotional, they're sharing information about themselves, and the cognitive dimension of engagement also comes in because you're asking them what are their goals for the course, what, do they, what is their baseline level of knowledge about the discipline or what you're going to be talking about in class, things like that. So icebreaker may seem like a simple activity, and it can be a simple activity, but you can get quite a bit of information out of it if you strategically use it in class. Another way that you can engage students with the course material and cognitive levels of the engagement dimension are to use a concept map. And concept maps are visual depictions of a student's understanding of the concepts 
and topics that you're talking about in class. There's a behavioral dimension, they're drawing. They can see the picture that they're drawing. They're demonstrating the key concepts and the connections and details related to various concepts. And it's, it's a different way for them to, to show their learning. It kind of makes their learning visual. And if you assign concept maps and have students turn them in or post them in your uh, Blackboard course, then you can see if there are common misunderstandings about certain topics in the class or if there's some gaps between their understanding. And it's, it's a very engaging way for students to work with the topics of the class. And then they can share it with each other and see the different ways that people visually depicted the information and their understanding. Does anybody use concept maps in their class? Can you raise your hand if you use concept maps in your class? OK, great. OK, Melanie, great. OK. OK, great. Thank you. So a number of people are using concept maps. Thank you very much. A couple of years ago, um, the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center rolled out a, a new version of the Blackboard Portfolio Tool on the NIU campus. And we created a number of tutorials and quick guides and support material for students and faculty to be able to use portfolios in their classes. And portfolios can be another way for students to engage with the material, to become more invested in the class. Because they can share the information and they, they curate the information in the portfolio tool, and they build it over time. As the instructor or faculty for the course, when you're using a portfolio, you can build in reflective activities. Reflection is a very important as pedagogical aspect of using a portfolio. So if you use a portfolio tool, carefully structure the requirements, um, think about what you want the students to include in that portfolio, connect it with the learning objectives for the course, and you can build in reflective questions to help students focus on what they learned from a specific assignment, what they want to learn for future assignments, maybe how they will how their study techniques were effective for this particular assignment, how maybe they could refine their techniques for a future assignment. And since the information is curated in a portfolio, students can see it in a more holistic way, and they tend to have some of those more aha moments, and they can share it with people in the class. So that could be a way that students could engage with each other, sharing their portfolios and making comments. It's a different way for them to engage with the material and connect with each other. And we have separate workshops on the Blackboard Portfolio Tool, and we host them a couple of times a year. So if you are interested in the Portfolio Tool and how you might use it to engage students with your class, I teach those workshops and I would be happy to help you implement that tool. Is, is anybody in the session using portfolios? We have a number of departments that use them and a number of... Okay, all right, Amanda, so you're using them. Uh, public administration is using them. Nursing is using them. They're, it's quite um, popular across campus. Okay, thank you. Social media is another way to help students engage in the class. And I will show you um, after we finish reviewing the, 
main slides, I will show you some different social media sites and how you might um, use them. I took a couple of screenshots. Um, the left-hand side screenshot is the NIU LinkedIn page, and it's sharing NIU research, and the research is related to the study identifying the hidden benefits of brainstorming. So you could use LinkedIn to have students, if they are pursuing um, the, the field that you're teaching, you could have them use LinkedIn to connect with professionals and other students in the field. So it increases their engagement and helps them to share their information more widely beyond the students enrolled in the class. Amanda, did you have a question? Okay, Amanda said they've used um, for freshman composition. Are you talking about the portfolio? Yes, okay. Amanda indicated that they used the portfolio for the freshman composition class. Thank you very much, Amanda. And then in terms of social media, on the right side, that is a screenshot from the NIU Twitter page. And we all know that many people are very involved and engaged with social media. And on the right side, you can see that NIU is sharing information about the affordability of our tuition. So what a great way to share information like that with a broad audience through their NIU Twitter page. So those are just a couple of examples how social media could be used to increase engagement. One of the things that you can do with Twitter is you can create a hashtag for, for your course. So I teach research courses and research proposal development courses and technology courses. So I might create a hashtag ETR 525 Spring 2018. So when I ask students to share information and questions about that course and they use that hashtag, then all of that discussion related to the ETR 525 course for Spring 2018 is it's captured with that hashtag. And I can go back, they can share information with each other, but they're also sharing it with a much broader audience in terms of Twitter, and then they can get information from other people. And since it's a tool that students like to use, it's something that you might consider using in terms of a different approach to engagement. Yes, Eric Zimmering indicated that Twitter hashtags are great because students can go back to prior semesters. Yes, that's that's a great, yes, because the information is captured and it's persistent information, so students in this semester can look at prior semesters. Thank you for sharing that, Eric, appreciate it. So Eric uses Twitter. Does anybody else use Twitter in their classes? Okay, but it's, it's something to consider. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Well, let's take a moment for you to share on the whiteboard. We talked about some different strategies for engagement. We talked about social media. We talked about um, concept maps, wordles. We had an example of one of those. What are some of the different techniques that you have used in your classes to increase engagement. So you can go to your whiteboard tools at the top and then write on the screen what different tools you've had, what techniques you have used to engage students in your class. Okay, in class, okay, debates. In class writing assignments, group work, okay, small 
looks like small group assignments. Jigsaw reading, okay. Storytelling, yes, storytelling and asking questions. Skits, okay, fix it. Written assignments, okay. Okay, reflecting on a picture or event to hear students' responses, okay. So you give them some kind of a prompt and then, um, so it's a picture or an event and then they respond and share their perspectives on it, okay. So in that just short, okay, Socratic method, hot seat, fishbowl, okay. All right, great ideas, great. So you can see in the different disciplines that we have represented here today, we have a lot of different examples of engagement. And we'll look at a couple of different tools today. Okay, a couple of people said in-class um, group work, in-class writing assignments, okay. Sharing stories, yes. And storytelling definitely has a powerful impact on um, retention of the information. If great storytellers have a profound power that can help people remember information. So those of you that do have the gift of storytelling, use it because it's very powerful in teaching and learning. Okay, so now we're going to talk about a few different instructional techniques um, that you can use. They're specific, simple techniques that you can use. The first one is called the 10-2 method. And it's related to the fact that there's quite a bit of research and um, data to show that people's attention, that, you know, people cannot maintain attention to, an to a lecture for 60 minutes. We have to have breaks and we have to interject different types of activities. So the 10-2 method is, uh, suggests that for every 10 minutes of instruction that you allow two minutes for students to process the information and to respond to the instruction. So when you think about using that in your class, you carefully think about how it makes sense to structure those activities. So we want to make sure that when we're sharing information, if we talk for 10 minutes or share information, however we share it for 10 minutes, we have to also allow students time to reflect and process that information. If they're just writing feverishly or typing feverishly in their laptops or tablets or whatever tools they use now, then they're not really thinking. It's, it's kind of a superficial connection with the material. But if you take some breaks and use strategic questioning to, to help students focus on key concepts that they really need to learn, then they will learn the material in a deeper way. They'll gain a uh, broader understanding as well. Another technique is, you know, we have kinesthetic learners and people don't want to just sit still for an hour, three hours. I don't know what length of courses you've taught. I've taught a wide variety of courses where sometimes they're all day, Saturday and Sunday and Friday night, and so you really have to vary the instructional methods and, and the pace and get them moving. And have students just stand up and talk to a partner. Even if you're in a large class, they can stand up. And it helps kind of keep their blood flowing and vary who they're engaging with. So have them engage with people to the right or to the left or the front or the back. Or a little movement can go a long way in just kind of keeping them engaged in the class. And that connects with that behavioral aspect we talked about. They're physically moving. Also varying the pace of your instruction. Sometimes speed up, 
uh, the pace of your talking. If it's a simpler concept, or slow it down. You can lower or raise your voice depending upon what you're trying to emphasize. Sometimes people lower their voice significantly to force students to really pay attention. And it can really help with engagement. Feedback is very important. We talk about that quite a bit in terms of pedagogy and um, supporting learning. Frequent feedback is important and effective feedback is important. So give them specific feedback that's aligned with the teaching and learning goals for the course. If it's vague, it won't help them learn. So try to be specific. The 3 two, one summary is a technique that you could use for during the last, let's say, seven minutes of a class session. You could ask the students to write down three things that they learned today during the class session, two interesting aspects of the topics discussed during the session, and one question that they still have about the topic that, dis that you discussed in class. And then after they do that, let's say you give them four minutes to write that down. And then you can provide them the opportunity to share the information with the partner for two minutes. And then you've had, that's kind of a, way, a different way to wrap up a class and to interject engagement. So you've asked them to think about what was discussed in class, what they learned, what they thought was interesting, and what they still have questions about. And you could collect that and you could see if a number of people still have questions about a certain issue. Then you'd want to address that by providing supplemental information or clarification in the next class session or possibly in the online learning management system to make sure that students are clear on those key concepts of the class. Or those responses could be posted in Blackboard. Blackboard is a wonderful tool in terms of um, maintaining the persistence of information so it, it doesn't go away. For, it's there for the whole class and so that's wonderful. And students can go back and look at it and ask questions. You could also have them share those summaries with you using a private journal tool in Blackboard. If you wanted to keep it private, then you could use the journal tool in Blackboard. Or you could make it public for the whole class to share. Depends on the sensitivity of the topic, things like that. And in the, in the right box, um, here I have a couple of different tools that I wanted to show you, just pull up the sites for a few of these so that you could see some quick tools that you might use in your class. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing this screen and then I will, okay, Amanda uses random.org, yes then I will pull up these different tools so that you can see them. So, okay, all right, so random.org is a tool that allows you to generate random lists. I use random.org every time that I, thank you, Dan, every time that I need to generate a list for my class. And presentation, the order of presentations is always a, can be kind of a controversial topic. So I use random.org to interject some uh, fairness and randomness into that order. And the students appreciate it. So you just put their names in into this list and you generate a list. And then it tells you the order. And then, um, or you can use it for numbers. And it'll just generate a list. 
Another tool that you can use is, it's called wheeldecide.com, and you can put in information, to generate lists. Um, so it's a simple tool, but it requires that you, you just click the, after you have set it up, you just click the screen, and for this case, we're just trying to select what to have for dinner, but you could use it for um, something in class, um, put the students' names in there uh, to try to make sure that you're calling on various students. Does anybody have any ideas about how they might use um, one of these wheel or random generators in their class? Okay, another, okay, let's see. Sharing in class, writing responses, okay to choose topics that students would like to discuss. Yes, um, thank you for sharing that, Kevin. That is definitely, you could put topics for discussion and then click the wheel and then whatever topic comes up, that could be the order. And so you wouldn't have to worry about being favoritism um, to any certain topic. Yes, thank you, good idea. Another tool that you can use is concept maps, you can see that there are a wide variety of different ways to depict information in visual ways using concept maps, and a number of you said that you do use them in class. Those of you that said you do use concept maps, what do you use the concept maps for in your class? Okay, so some of the people um, were in the art department and um, different disciplines, so you could use them for students to show connections among the different topics and details related to those topics. Okay, great, thank you. And then another tool that I wanted to show you was there's a, a free online puzzle maker. And I'm not endorsing any of these tools. I'm just showing that there are a variety of different tools that you can use. So you could generate um, different types of puzzles. If there are terms that students need to learn in your course, um, there are terms that we need to know for all of our disciplines. So maybe they do a concept map. Maybe they do puzzles. Maybe they use that wheel for um, trying to engage them in different ways. When you bring in the variety, you connect with different students. And when they're engaged, then they're more likely to share information and, and think deeper about it and ask more questions about it. And also at NIU, as you all know, we have the, um, wanted to show you our Facebook page. So NIU has a very strong social media presence, and it's a great way to connect with students to engage. You can do that with your class, some of those different social media tools that we talked about. So those are, and as Dr. Zemering said, he uses Twitter in his class. Thank you for sharing that. Now I'm going to stop sharing that information and go back to the presentation. Okay, one of the things that we also would like to touch on today is teaching large classes. Those of you that teach large classes know that there are challenges related to teaching large classes, and there are many techniques that are available that you can use to be successful when teaching large classes. One of the things that is important is to structure the class to include clear 
questions. So clear breaks with specific questions. And we talked about that earlier with that 10-2 method. So when you're preparing your design, and this works for smaller classes too, make sure that you have built-in specific questions. And when you design those questions, put some time into ahead of, ahead of time to make sure that the questions that you've designed align with the goals of the course and are purposeful and thoughtful in moving the students along when you're teaching the topics. So carefully think about your questions to elicit specific key concepts and issues that you want to make sure you cover in class. And you can provide background information to focus them. So perhaps you would project some kind of a, a chart or something for them to look at, a picture, something related to the question that you want to kind of prompt them to think about for the question and answering and formulating their response. So you post that focus diagram or chart or picture on the screen and then ask targeted questions that connect with your objectives for the day and then allow them a, a couple of minutes to think about their own response and then you can have them stand up, turn around, talk to people very close to them, just you're kind of interjecting the movement into this large lecture hall class, have them share but they've already had time to think about it and formulate a response and have them share the response with other students close to them. And then to expedite the activity in a large class, what you could do is after the students have shared information with other people standing around them, you could ask them to sit down. And then you could project, you have already have a pre-prepared list of typical responses that are shared when this activity is done in class. You could project that on the screen. And then you could ask the students to share, is there anything else related to that question that they discussed with their groups or with their partners that's not already on that list? So that's one option for you to expedite the process where alternatively you could have a few groups or partners share their information and it's that's a safer way to share information in a large class because the students are sharing the responses of their group rather than their inf their individual information so they feel more comfortable saying my group discussed these topics and these responses rather than saying my specific perspective in, in front of 300 people so it's a it's a different approach that makes it safer and they're, they tend to be more engaged with that. Make eye contact with the class. So see the class. So if you have 300 students or 100 students or however many, you can still connect with them. You can walk around, um, connect with their eyes so that they know that you appreciate them as a person and they feel like they're in a smaller class. And when you ask a question, wait a few moments to allow the students time to formulate their answer because if you wait a few minutes and there's a large class you'll start to see more hands go up over a period of time so um, you know I know it's hard but just take a few minutes and and let them formulate their answers and you'll increase engagement with the in that class and select a question that generates discussion so you wouldn't want to select a question that is, has one answer. That's not going to generate engagement or discussion in the class. Select questions that have maybe very different perspectives that can, be, uh, that can emerge in response to that question. And then when you're facilitating the discussion, connect it with those key components of the course material that you're addressing. And if students haven't raised the different perspectives, then you can just question and probe and say, well, you know, you talked about this perspective of, of 
global issues, but what about this? How, how might this other population think about that same issue? And it is very important to carefully structure the design of the course for each day so that you have, it makes sense and that when you use these activities that they align with your learning and teaching objectives and they make sense to students and allow you enough time to cover the material that you need to cover and the students enough time to learn and reflect. Um, and I would encourage you to start with a simple activity and you know when you get comfortable with that then you can incrementally increase and kind of expand the types of activities that you you use in class to increase engagement. Now in just kind of wrapping up on the whiteboard, um, there's a question, how could you use a technique that we discussed in one of your classes? Um, so, you know, we talked about uh, 3 two, one or we talked about 10-2, where 10 minutes and 2 minutes for the students to um, think about it and work on topics, or 3 two, one where you, they write down three things they learned today and two interesting things, and one thing they have a question about or concept maps or portfolios. Can you think about a way that you might use, or one of those tools that you might use in one of your classes? And type it on the whiteboard, please. OK. so. Those different things um, are coming up. The random.org and the wheel, okay. Okay. The puzzle, okay. Concept maps, three, two, one. Okay, have the students write down one question and a natural stopping point, okay. Okay, so there are a couple of different ideas about techniques that you might use that we talked about today. So we are coming to the end of the discussion. Are there any questions, any remaining questions? I'm going to share the link to the recording in a couple of days. When I send out the evaluation, I will also send you out an evaluation of the material. And I would like to thank you all for coming and engaging today. And I wish each of you a fabulous spring 2018 semester. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye.